Happy Saturday. How many of you are truly happy today, Jesus? You know, we have so much to be thankful for. God is so good. He's good all the time. The sunshine and the rain. The cheerfulness. When things are going smoothly, but also the difficulties of life. God is always faithful. God is always good. And praise His holy name that we can be together as a family in His presence today. I just uh, want to bring you greetings from the beautiful islands of Hawaii. How many of you have ever been to Hawaii before? Anyone been to Hawaii before? How many of you wish you'd been to Hawaii before? <laughs> you know, Hawaii is a little island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's where my wife and I are from. And uh, we have a ministry called the Revelation of Hope Ministries where we get to travel and do evangelism. And uh, this past year has been a very busy year for us. Uh, this is actually our 12th country that we visited this year uh, doing ministry, and we're so glad to be here in the beautiful land of India with a few beautiful people to share this beautiful time together. Uh, this morning's presentation is going to be different from what, is, uh, what you find in the bulletin. The Holy Spirit is probably going to share something a little bit different, but I trust that God is going to speak a special message to each one of us today. You know, according to man's plan, I wasn't supposed to be here today. We were invited to speak at the IYC in the Northeast because of the unrest. Unfortunately, those meetings had to be canceled. The Lord opened the way for us to be here this weekend with you. And I believe that the Lord is wanting to communicate a special message to someone here today. And I invite you to open your hearts and minds to hear God's voice speaking to you as an individual as we deal with this very serious and solemn subject this morning entitled The Solemnity of a Single Choice. Please take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. As we begin our study this morning, we go to Deuteronomy the 30th chapter, where we read these powerful words of Scripture from the Lord appealing to the hearts of humanity. Deuteronomy chapter 30, notice the Bible says, beginning with verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19, before we read this, let us pray. Dear Lord, we hope in your holy word. And again, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, open our eyes and our ears, that we might be receptive of this truth. Please, Holy Spirit, fill this room, and I pray that you remove every demonic distraction, every unclean spirit that would cause our minds to wander, that would cause us to feel sleepy, that would cause us to talk when we should be listening. We pray that those spirits will be removed in Jesus' name. And that only the Holy Spirit would reign in this place this morning. Lord, I pray that you would please hide me behind the cross. Speak to me and speak through me. And I pray that we would all be blessed as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19. It says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Here we read the words from the God of heaven, appealing to humanity, appealing to us as his sons and daughters, He's begging and pleading for us to choose life. He is setting before us two options. Life and death. Blessing and cursing. You see, friends, God is not a God of force. He's not a God of coercion. He is a God of love. And because He's a God of love, He has given to us the freedom of choice. But friends, love by nature requires freedom in order to exist. In other words, love dies when there is no freedom. Love dies in slavery. But the disturbing paradox of freedom is that with freedom, someone can actually choose to die as a slave. With freedom, someone can make the terrible choice to die as a slave. And so God gives us the freedom to choose one or the other. You see, friends, we were created with freedom to choose our own destiny. Our life is in God's hands, but our destiny is in our very own hands. 
the Almighty God has chosen never to choose for us. We are absolutely free to determine our destiny. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Young people, this morning I want to communicate to you especially the awesome solemnity of the freedom of choice that God has given to us. The Bible here in this passage invites us to live and choose how we want to live. But to also keep in mind that every decision and every choice that we make, we will have to meet in the final judgment. Every decision we make will bring eternal repercussions. Thus, every choice that we make ought to be made with eternity in mind. And so today, we want to examine and measure the enormity and the non-neutrality of the decisions that we make day by day. To see how in one moment, in one instant, one choice and one mistake can take us down a dark path to perdition. We're going to study a story in the Bible this morning that begs us, that pleads with us to make the right decision. The decision to choose life instead of death. Blessing instead of cursing. Light instead of darkness. Here's the story in the Bible of a slave that was made free. And in freedom, he began to ascend the summit of success. He climbed higher and higher to the pinnacle of praise and power. By his courageous ac accomplishments, this individual attained wealth and luxury, riches and respect, prestige and position. His story could have gone down in history as someone who was a nobody, that despite his difficulties became a somebody, one who future generations could look towards and point to it as an example of success. That's how his story could have ended. But alas, his legacy is one of frightening failure and painful perdition. You see, this man we're talking about today, he rose to power. But because of one foolish choice after another, he fell into the abyss of abject failure. Yes, he was a slave that was made free. But then the Bible tells us that he forfeited his freedom and in a time, a lost slave. And his story is one of the saddest, most, most pathetic stories in all of Scripture. And so I invite you this morning to come with me on a journey as we look at Jesus through the eyes of this individual. Listen to his horrific history. He was born in the Roman Empire as the very lowest of slaves. As a slave, he ended up in the armed service of the Roman Empire. And you can imagine the lack of loyalty of one who is forced to be a soldier. But he became a mighty warrior in the legions of the Roman Empire. He was fearless in fight, brave in battle, courageous in conflict, because Perhaps he felt like he had nothing to lose. He was a slave anyway. He had a winner-takes-all attitude. And his skill and his leadership ended up becoming a great asset for the Roman Empire. He began to ascend higher and higher in the ranks and responsibilities of Rome. And finally he ascended as high as he could go as a slave in the Roman legions. But a slave can only go so high. And one day, this man's courageous exploits were brought to the attention of the Caesar of Rome. And in recognition of his bravery in battle, his valor in victories, Caesar authorized a change of status for this slave. He granted him freedom so that he could continue to rise up in the ranks of leadership in Rome. And this man ended up becoming one of the most loyal servants of the emperor. His years of victory won the confidence of the king, the loyalty of the legions, and the praise of the people. 
And finally, after years of faithful service, this individual retired as a great hero of the Roman Empire. He returned back to Rome amidst the applause of an appreciative nation. He was actually taken into the household of Caesar to live out his years in retirement there. And while he was in Caesar's house, he met and married a woman by the name of Claudia Popula. She was actually a relative of Caesar. He met her there in that royal household, ended up marrying her, and so now this man who was a slave ended up marrying into the royal family. And so you can imagine, life couldn't be any better. There was no complaints, it was all good. But as the years went by, this man became restless in retirement. He wanted something else to do. The quiet, lazy life of retirement was not agreeable to him. You see, he was a man of action, not of idleness. He lived his life amid the clash of arms. And so anxious for another assignment, he requested of the king to give him something else to do. And at that time in history, there was only one really great troubled spot in the Roman Empire, and that was the place called Palestine. Palestine during that time, was a sizzling, seething, boiling pot of unrest and sedition. And so here was a challenge that this individual was confident to conquer. So he was assigned to be the governor of this land. He took his wife and he moved his family there to Jerusalem. Who exactly is this person we're talking about? We're talking about the proud and the pitiful Pontius Pilate. He was fierce and dogmatic in his administration. He hated the Jews, and they felt the same way about him. There was all this tension between Pilate and the people, and so things continued to deteriorate, and the tension continued to mount until the tension climaxed into an early morning conflict where Pilate was rudely awakened to confront a day unlike any other day he had experienced before. Because on this day, Pilate was brought face to face with decisions. Choices that he could not avoid. Things that he had to decide. What to do with the man that was brought before him. A man that he did not realize would end up changing his eternal destiny. You see, little did he know that the decisions that he would make on this day would determine his destiny. And what we're going to see as we open God through this morning is that Pilate made 10 miserable mistakes. How many? How many? I hope you're listening carefully with your ears and with your heart this morning. Because as we trace these 10 miserable, miserable mistakes that Pilate made, we want to ask ourselves the question, am I making these same mistakes? And so it's a message this morning that invites us to search our hearts, to take inventory of our lives, to afflict our souls. Please take your Bible to, and turn with me to the book of John chapter 18. John chapter 18. We, where we find Pilate confronting this day of mistakes. I can imagine that when Pilate was awakened that morning, he had to be irritated. He was disturbed from his sleep and summoned by the very people he passionately hated and held in utmost contempt. And so when Pilate woke up, he was irritated and he was anxious to take care of business so he could go back to sleep. But here was the situation that required more than a quick fix. What exactly happened on this day? We pick up the story in John chapter 8, beginning with verse 28. John 8, verse 28. And if you're there and if you're ready to study the Bible this morning, would you please let me know by saying amen? John 8, 28. The Bible says this. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was heard, to be exact, it was 6 o'clock in the morning. It was heard. It says, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, that they might eat the Passover. So here Pilate is rudely awakened by the Jews. 
The Bible tells us that they are bringing a man to him by the name of Jesus on the day of the Passover. But the Jews refused to enter into this Gentile court on their holy day. Why? Because entering into this Gentile court would have rendered them ceremonially unclean and would have forbidden them of eating the Passover lamb. Can you imagine that? What hypocrisy. They are so concerned with their ceremonial uncleanness when all the while their hands are dripping with the blood of the true Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice their indictment towards Christ. Verse 30. They answered and said to him, actually verse 20, 29. They didn't go in, so Pilate came out. Verse 29, Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a male factor, we would not have delivered, delivered him up unto thee. My friends, let me ask you, what's missing in what the Jews just said to Pilate? Pilate is asking what the accusation is. And what's missing in the response? The real accusation. The Jews simply say, if he were not guilty, we would not have brought him to you. They're not, uh, they're not making it clear what their accusation is. And here's the reason, friends, is because they knew that Jesus was not worthy of death in the eyes of the Roman court. The Jews did not want to have a trial. They feared a trial because they knew that they could not substantiate their accusations. They wanted Pilate to ratify the death sentence in haste. They wanted to skip all the preliminaries. They thirsted for the blood of, of Jesus. And so they came to Pilate that morning, seeking a favor from, from him on the day of their national holiday. And by saying to Pilate, if he were not guilty, we would not have brought him to you. They were trying to impress Pilate with the sense of their importance. In other words, if we, the most important people in Israel, bring someone to you, then they have to be guilty because we wouldn't do such a thing. Take our word for it, in other words, is what they're saying. And Pilate responds in verse 31. And he said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. But then the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put a man to death. My friends, here we find Pilate's first mistake. And I hope you write it down. Pilate was not interested in knowing the truth. As a judge, it was his responsibility to know exactly why this criminal was brought before him. And so instead of investigating, instead of asking questions, he simply said, you take him and you judge him. In other words, Pilate was indifferent. He wasn't really interested in finding out the truth. He did not sense the solemnity of the situation. He didn't consider this situation a matter of high priority. He felt that there were other things more important than this. Surely this was not something to lose sleep over. And friends, many people are making the exact same mistake today. You see, Jesus, through his word, knocks at the door of our heart. But many people are not interested in knowing the truth. Many people are not interested to hear what Jesus is trying to say. Why? Because we feel like there are more important things than eternity. We feel like there's things that are more urgent. We're more urgent. And this is a temptation especially for young people. Many times as young people, we think to ourselves, when I get older and I can't do anything else, then I'll investigate the truth. Then I'll give my life to Jesus. But let me have fun first. Let me establish my career. Let me get married. Let me do this and that. Let me live my life how I want to live first. And then later on, I'll find out what the truth is. But like Pilate, friends, it is our responsibility to search out and to know the truth. Choosing to sleep in the darkness of ignorance will not afford us an excuse in the judgment. The Bible says that God's people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Not because the knowledge is inaccessible. It is accessible. Why are they destroyed? Why is there lack of knowledge? It's just because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also re reject thee. When we 
cast the truth down to the level of unimportance. That, my friends, is a dangerous mistake. Listen carefully, friends. There's nothing more important than truth. More important than the school you go to, the career you pursue, the place that you live, or the person that you marry, is to know what is the truth for yourself. Because Jesus promised us that only when we know the truth, we will experience the freedom that the truth can bring. And so Pilate, his first mistake, he wasn't interested in finding out what the truth was. He said to him, you judge him according to your own law. But then the Jews say, but our law does not permit us to put someone to death. That belongs to the, juris in the jurisdiction of Rome. And so Pilate realizes that this is a life and death situation. But friends, we have to understand that Pilate was not a just judge. Many times in history, Pilate had delivered innocent men to their death without a second thought. As a hardened pagan Roman, he did not value the sanctity of life. He didn't so much care about justice, he cared more about his position and his power. But on this day, with this criminal, with this victim, something held Pilate back from his common cruelty. There is something different with this situation. There is something different about the accusers as well as the accused. Because this man that stood before him did not look like the other criminals that he had seen day by day. You see, when Jesus stood before Pilate, and when Pilate's eyes fell upon Christ for the first time, strange feelings began to stir up within his heart. Because when he looked into the face of Jesus, he saw something in the face of Jesus he had not seen in any other face before. He saw in Jesus' face a serene calmness, an innocence, of purity. He saw no sign of guilt, no trace of fear, no boldness or defiance in the face of Christ. He saw an individual who was calm and peaceful. He looked not like a criminal, but he looked more like a holy man. The glory of God and the signature of heaven was shining upon the countenance of Christ. His whole being stood firm in conscious innocence. As the heavy surges of wrath broke upon Christ, Jesus remained uneffective and unmoved like a solid rock in the midst of an angry ocean. And to all the false charges of the Jews, he answered not a word. He stood there before Pilate, silent. But his silence was golden. His silence was eloquent. And Pilate began to think to himself, how can this man, bear injury and insult, mockery and abuse without a desire to retaliate. As Pilate looked upon the countenance of the accused, the Holy Spirit began to convict him that this was not a criminal. The Spirit of God began to convict Pilate that he needed to leave this man alone, that this man has done nothing worthy of death. Pilate began to realize that the Jews brought him because of envy. And they desired to destroy anyone that would stand in their, in their way to power. Pilate understood that. Pilate knows that, that, he, that the Jews want him just to sign the death warrant without asking any questions. And Pilate, Pilate could have easily done it as he had done it so many times before. But now the troubling conviction of the Holy Spirit is calling him to use his decision-making power and position to stop the injustice of the Jews. But here's the problem. Pilate knows that if he was to stand up with backbone and do the right thing, the Jews would cause him trouble. And Pilate did not want to be troubled and he did not want to be inconvenienced. And so there's a, there's a conflict of conviction that takes place in his mind conflict between comfort and conviction. Pilate brings the prisoner into the judgment hall and he begins the interrogation and all along with Jesus, he then asks him the question in verse 33. Notice what it says in verse 33. 
Then Pilate entered the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And then Jesus responds to his question with another question. Verse 40, verse 34. Jesus answered, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? In other words, Jesus is saying to Pilate, What do you think? Are you asking this question because you kind of think that I am the king of the Jews? Or are you simply asking this question because that's what somebody else told you about me? Now friends, why is Jesus asking Pilate this question? Let me ask you, does Jesus already know the answer to the question he's asking yes or no? Of course he knows the answer. So why is he asking if he already knows the answer to the question? Well, here's the reason, friends. Because as Jesus looked upon Pilate, Jesus could see beyond the outward exterior, he saw that Pilate had a little bit of faith in his heart. Jesus could see the conviction of the Holy Spirit on the countenance of Pilate. And so Jesus asked the question to give Pilate an opportunity to express the conviction he's feeling at that present moment. Why? Because expression deepens impression. You see, Jesus wanted to save Pilate. And he knew that there was hope for him. And salvation, friends, first begins when we yield to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so now, Jesus asked Pilate the question. And now Pilate is brought face to face with another choice. His choice, will I be vulnerable? and share the conviction of my heart? Or will I resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit? How he answers the question of Jesus will set him down a path of life or death. What does Pilate do? Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee to me. What hast thou done? My friends, notice, Pilate's pride forbade him from becoming born. And here is Pilate's second mistake. Write it down. Second mistake number two, he ignored the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He refused to answer the question and acknowledge the conviction of his heart. He refused to respond to the first promptings of the Holy Spirit. And friends, many people are making the same mistake today. You see, friends, the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of truth and error. It is to convict us of right and wrong. The Holy Spirit comes to us in different times and in different ways. When you're on the internet and you're looking at a website that you ought not to be looking at, it's the Holy Spirit's job to say, you should not be looking at this. When you're dating a non-Christian or a non-Adventist and you're unequally young, it's the Spirit's responsibility to convict you and make you uncomfortable in that relationship, saying, you should not be with this person. Or when you skip church to attend a secular event, in moments like these, when the Spirit of God convicts us of the truth, we are brought face to face with two options. Either we will, we will acknowledge the conviction and yield to the Holy Spirit. Or we will ignore the conviction to do our own thing. And friends, that's what Pilate did. He ignored the conviction. And this mistake may seem small, but one mistake leads to another. Resisting the first time makes it easier for us to resist the second time. But Jesus kept working with Pilate, and he said to him in verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So Jesus assures Pilate, that he does not need to be afraid of the accusation of the Jews. That his kingdom is not a kingdom that is worldly, that has mountains and rivers for borders. His kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. Christ did not come to seek for political power, but rather he came to set up a, 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 a spiritual kingdom of grace in this world. So what then is the nature of his kingdom? 
Verse 37, you say rightly that I'm king. For this cause was I born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the what, everyone? To the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. My friends, when, when Jesus said that, Pilate's suspicion is suspended. And now his curiosity is aroused. And now Pilate responds to Jesus, and he asks Jesus the question of all questions. My friends, listen. This has to be the most profound question that anyone has ever asked Jesus. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? If your kingdom is a kingdom of truth, then what is truth? The friends have to understand that from the very beginning of time, man has searched for the answer to that question. But now, the very one that can give Pilate as well as us, the absolute answer to that question is standing right in front of him. He asked Jesus, what is truth? But at the very moment he asked the question, the very moment that Pilate was opening, was open to receive the answer to the question, what is truth? The very moment he was open to the truth, the devil brought a deafening distraction. Because on the outside, the Jews were listening to the conversation of Pilate and Jesus. And they could hear the conversation. And, and when Pilate asked that question, all of a sudden the Jews, afraid that Jesus would slip through their hands, began to make a lot of noise. And Pilate was distracted when he heard the shouts of the crowd. And when he heard the shouts of the crowd on the outside of the judgment hall, he was brought face to face with another choice. His choice, either stay with Jesus and listen to how Christ, Christ answers his question, or respond to the noise of his ears and listen to the shout of the crowd. And tragically, Pilate made the wrong choice. Instead of listening with his heart to Jesus, he listened with his ears to the crowd. He leaves the presence of Jesus without hearing how Christ would answer. And now the golden opportunity has passed. Here is Pilate's third mistake. Write it down. Mistake number three. He allowed himself to be what? Distracted from the truth. You see, Pilate didn't have to leave the presence of Jesus and go and, and, and respond to the crowd. But he chose to turn away. Have you done this? Are you doing this right now? You see, my friends, in a similar way, Jesus wants to reveal to us the truth. But the devil works overtime to stop our ears from hearing it. We live in a world of constant demonic distraction. There's the media that's captivating our eyes and our ears, drawing us away from the truth. We live in a very fast-paced society, and sometimes the busyness of life absorbs our time and our energies and our attention to when we have no time to listen to the answer to the question of what is true. Sometimes there are family obligations, family responsibilities, family functions, nothing wrong in and of itself, but sometimes those things can distract us from hearing what is true appointments and commitments and things that are not really important. My friend, listen, you don't have to be a slave to the devil's distractions. You, like Pilate, have a choice to make. Don't allow anything or anyone to keep you from hearing the truth. It's more important than what the crowd is saying to you. And so, he left the presence of Jesus. Because of the distractions of the crowd. Now, friends, this story is also recorded in the book of Luke. I'd like you to go to Luke real quick because Luke gives us some additional details that have some powerful lessons for us today. Go to Luke chapter 23. Notice what it says in verse 4. Luke 23, verse 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the people, I find no fault in this man. So Pilate declares that the prisoner is innocent. Now tell me, friends, the moment Pilate declares him innocent, 
What should he do next? As the judge. I find no fault in him. Now what should Pilate do? Tell me. He needs to do what? Let him go. If this man is innocent, then as a judge, justice demands for the judge to let the innocent man go. But Pilate does not do that. Why? Because he's afraid of the protest of the people. So notice how the Jews respond to the verdict of Pilate in verse 5. And it says, they're more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching from all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether this man was a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that it belonged to, uh, to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also at Jerusalem at that time. I want you to notice, friends. Instead of Pilate doing the right thing, he finds a way to get out of this sticky situation. Instead of letting Jesus go, he sends him where? To Herod. Why? Not because he needed Herod's help. Pilate had the authority to make the decision as judge. But rather, he sent him to Herod in order to get out of this situation. Instead of doing the right thing. It was a sorry excuse that he made. Here is Pilate's fourth and fifth mistake. I hope you'll write it down and note it carefully. Number four, Pilate procrastinates. He doesn't make a decision right away. He puts off making a decision. Pilate is a coward, friends. But sometimes we're, we're full of cowardice just like Pilate. He didn't want to deal with the situation. It was inconvenient. He sought to be released of the responsibility of Jesus. He's seeking to avoid the potential problems and repercussions of doing the right thing. Oh, my friends, have you done this? Are you doing this today? Through the preaching and the studying of the word, Jesus, the truth, comes to us. Will you send him away? Will you put off making a decision and brush him off as unimportant? My friends, before it's over, everyone will have to, de to decide for themselves what they will do for Jesus. It's not something we can put off for eternity. It's not a responsibility we can ever escape from. Procrastination will lead to perdition. In Pilate's fifth mistake, is that he also tried to remain neutral about the situation. He didn't help Jesus by setting him free, nor did he hurt Jesus by condemning him to death. He didn't really take a side at first. He simply sent him to Herod, let somebody else deal with him. It's too much for me. Let me just sit back and watch to see how things are gonna play out. And friends, when it comes to Christ's claims upon our lives, it is impossible to be neutral about Jesus. Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me, and he that does not gather with me scatters abroad. There is no neutrality in spirituality. It's either we're with Christ or we are against Christ. It's either we're going to be saved or we're going to be lost. And listen, friends, if we are almost saved, we are still completely Lost. What a tragedy to be almost saved. So close and yet so far. You see, either we're going to crown Jesus as king or we're going to crucify him as a criminal. Never be afraid, never be ashamed, friends, to take a side, to stand for that which is right. Pilate feels relieved at first that he does not have to deal with the situation. He tries to re remain neutral. He sends him to Pilate and he's relieved until, excuse me, he sends him to Herod, Herod, and he's relieved until Herod sends him right back. And now Pilate realizes that he cannot escape from this decision. And so now, now notice what happens in verse 14. Pilate says to the Jews, you have brought this man unto me as one that perverts the people. I've examined him, and I found no fault in this man concerning the things you accused him of. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and though nothing worthy of death is done to him. And so, 
the conviction is confirmed. He's innocent. He's free. Not only does he feel that of Herod too, he has the affirmation of Herod that pronounces Jesus as innocent. Now Pilate ought to let him go. He has the verdict of Herod too. But Pilate is a coward. He wavers in weakness. Instead of letting him go, he says to the Jews in verse 16, 